Okay, so we will continue with next unit. This is unit four. Um, sorry, unit three. According to our new syllabus, it says unit five because this is an older version. Uh, this is chapters um, thirteen and fourteen. Thirteen is uh, array subsystems, and uh, chapter fourteen is special subsystems in the textbook. Okay, so most of it is the first part only. A little bit we will look at the special subsystems which looks at packaging, power distribution, clock, etc. Clock, of course, now we have a separate unit. The fifth unit we will look at more into the clocking part. So we'll start with the first part of this unit which is the array subsystems. And a very nice picture, this is in the textbook also is the division of memory elements based on the different types of um, classifications at the top level we have the classification based on the addressing so when we say random access memory this is the single largest class and what random means is any address location the amount of time taken to access the memory is the same so that is the random access memory serial access memory as the name suggests we access the elements of our memory serially that is in a particular order so best examples are uh, shift registers where we shift it inside in either the front or the back of the queue is accessible and the last class is a special uh, class called as CAM or Content Addressable Memory and the biggest application is flash memory, uh, sorry not flash memory where uh, we need the actual contents also to be accessible and uh, this is uh, finds application in virtual memories where we are looking to see if a particular element not a particular address but a particular element is there in the memory or not and this will also be part of the overall classification called as camps and if you look at this particular class itself random access memory we have two divisions volatile and non-volatile and volatile means that it continuously needs power supply non-volatile is more of a long-term memory so our hard disk for example is non-volatile because we can switch off the computer switch off all power supply come back after six months and the contents will still be there external hard drive or a pen drive even so those come under non-volatile volatile memory is where we have power supply continuously given and we have two classes static ram sram and dynamic ram or dram and under the non volatile we have more um, some of these are historic for example i don't know if mass rom is used anymore these are programmable rom one time programmable so for example our bios uh, you might have seen the bios in your computer we don't have much control over that it is one time programmable and these are also for many other uh, legacy systems where the hardware is proprietary we want you to use it but you're not able to see the internals and that is programmable one time programmable at the manufacturer uh, level itself second level of that is erasable programmable so this is a slight modification of this and these two are both sort of related to each other once technology evolved programmable became erasable programmable and the first generation was through uh, external sources such as um, uv light etc and then we have electrically erasable and the final evolution of that which is most popular today is the flash rom so we'll see all of these briefly and the memory architecture itself um, if you look at this is of course um, random access memory we have we, we have generally uh, 
depending on the application the sizes may vary but usually they will be a row and a column decoder so the row and the column decoder will be given parts of the address and they will decode that is we have multiple lines that are coming out of the row decoder and the column decoder and the functionality is based on the inputs um, only one of these lines have to go high similarly for the row decoder also and generally the intersection of those two will be one single cell not necessarily one bit it might be a eight bit cell and that's the memory that is being accessed and that could be for reading or writing depending on the other control signals and finally on top here you see the bit line conditioning circuitry so what is the meaning of this is it could be doing two things one is when the read or write is not happening it could just be maintaining the cells at their correct values by giving some signals appropriate signals another thing that could be happening is when the for example read or write is happening the data might come into these cells okay so that is the bit line conditioning part which is on top here so this in general is a general uh, structure of random access memories and inside the cells there can be different type of implementation we could have uh, static ram you can have dynamic ram etc okay so our first of the memory structures that we are going to see is the static ram or sram and before we go into the details just a little bit of background so static ram already we have come across static ram before if you remember in the first unit when we were talking about fpga fabrics the lookup table is implemented as a static ram and one of the reasons why it's implemented in that way is the speed among all the options that are available static ram memories are the fastest and in this this thing also the same reason is why the memory so if you remember computer organization you have control unit memory all that so the memory part of a processor is usually implemented as static ram almost always uh, there's no other option and this is the fastest and static ram what is called as primary memory for example this is the uh, memory from which all the operations of the arithmetic logic unit all the operands go from this primary memory this is implemented as static ram so this is deep inside the processor and the the primary memory actually is all very low maybe 8k or 16k bytes that's all not very large and this is uh, the main functionality of static ram very 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 fast memories if you want to implement relatively low power also fast and low power you have the option of static ram and before we go into the details just a little bit about history obviously this is this has been around for a long time so there's not much options for uh, research in static ram um, many other options also so for example first we will look at uh, the six transistor implementation then there is a slight modification to that which is the eight transistor implementation so by far it is the most uh, popular this thing for practical circuits also eight transistor implementation so it's not very easy to modify that because of a lot of other constraints so it's not um, possible to come up with a new ram structure because we have to look at so many other things also uh, before we can say that this is better in some particular way etc so the way to use this unit is today if you are working for example a couple of years back there was a student who was doing a project in uh, amd or somewhere and so he 
was working on some project which required a memory cook and this is the typical use today somebody some specialist for example his vendor was dolphin systems french company so they were supplying the memory core which he was using as part of his project and uh, the ip core has to be interfaced so obviously he has to know about the functionality how exactly does the sram work and what are the signals required for reading writing etc and that is the most important functionality of this particular topic also how do we use a particular sram memory core given to us how do we read the data sheets and how do we read the data sheets to make sense of its functionality and uh, that's what we will also discuss and of course uh, there are certain still certain applications so for that we will look at the design of the sram cell also so the sram cell actually the first a cell that we are going to look at is also the smallest of the sram cells probably the 60 or 6 transistor sram cell and it's very compact design and all the functionality is done through just these 6 transistors and that is the added complexity in terms of the signaling is because the number of transistors is low and the because of the importance in the size of a cell six transistor is used maybe if you can come up with 18 or 20 transistors you can have a simpler design in terms of the signaling etc but 20 transistors is a lot because we are talking about the lowest level in the architecture we are talking about making this on the die this is not off chip memory this is not secondary memory this is the most important primary memory so the size is very important and that is why we are living with a six transistor cell at the cost of added complexity because the number of transistors or the area of the circuit is low and <clears throat> this transistor memory idea is very simple um, it is just a cross coupled inverter so if you look i'll just draw that here how does the memory work okay so if you redraw this in a different way this is what it looks like there is just a set of inverters okay that is connected back to back and those inverters are responsible for storing the memory and as you know static cmos inverters require power for functionality and that is why these are also volatile meaning if you don't have power supply then they will not store the memory but as long as the power supply is there these back to back inverters are what we see here these back to back inverters are responsible for storing the data and this blue line is just extended here it's the same blue line these are responsible for accessing the memory cell so the cell is storing something now uh, if you want to read or write you have to turn on this signal okay so from low to high and once that is high then these two transistors are on and then we can read what is on either of these sides of the inverter and that is for both reading and writing we will use the same operation so these two transistors here they are called as a1 and a2 these are called as the access transistors and access transistors naturally because they are used to access the cell and these are the memory storage element the actual memory is stored inside these two back to back inverters and it's interesting that it is the same a memory elements in almost all the other more complicated structures like latches and flip flops also the actual memory element where is the data being stored it's in a pair of static cmos inverters both in latches and in flip flops and the same thing here also okay so that is the basic explanation of a six transistor sram cell four transistors are used to realize the memory element back to back inverters so if this is your data queue okay 
this could be the complement obviously because it's an inverter and these are the data cells so q and q bar the actual data that is being stored data and its complement and these are the access transistors and this side is a particular line so this is all part of that bit line conditioning that we talked about earlier so we have bit and we have another line which we will call bit bar okay and that's just a name it doesn't exactly mean that always it's going to be bit bar it's called bit bar okay but sometimes it might be sometimes we might not have bit bar on it that we will see okay and this is the basic six transistor sram cell and in terms of the operation okay the operation is complicated a little bit complicated okay so uh, like i said even though it's called bit and bit bar doesn't necessarily mean that they are always opposites of each other okay so when the word line is zero that is if you look at this diagram if the access transistors are both off then q and q bar are just storing okay this is where no read or write is happening it is just storing the data whether you want to read or whether you want to write okay for both of them the first operation is this signal has to go from low to high which means that these two transistors are on now depending on the values in bit and bit bar it will be either read or write operation and that is all automatically determined by the values on bit and bit bar and here is where all the complications arise because there are only these many signals and transistors we don't have any more separate signals for read write etc in the six transistor design so we have to work only with this many amount of signals to perform all the operations so the way it works is suppose we have a write operation okay the wl signal this is word or word line signal wl has to go high that is the same okay now if it is a read operation what we have to do is both bit and bit bar okay should be equal to 1 equal to 1 this is for the read operation okay for read operation both bit and bit bar equal to 1 this is set by us externally and when wl becomes 1 whatever data is there okay we want that to get transferred to the bit line if it is 1 it will stay at 1 if it is 0 this has to go from 1 to 0 and the complement has to appear on the bit bar so definitely only one of these two will change both cannot change right because data can be one or zero if it is one then this will stay at one this will have to go to zero if it is zero then this will have to go to zero and this will be have to continue at one so that is the read operation for the write operation okay that is slightly different in the write operation whatever data we want okay you put that in the bit lines now bit and bit bar will become so for example if i want to write one okay then i will put one here i will put zero here this is the write operation for the write operation that is i want to write into the cell now what i have to do is i put bit one here okay and i put zero here and that has to go into the cell and this has to go into the cell if it was storing one originally then no problem but if it was storing zero originally then it has to get rewritten to one and if this was zero this would have been one so this one has to become zero so there has to be change in the state of q and q bar possibly and this is the write operation so read operation write operation it's all summarized here when wl equal to 1 when both are high then data and its complement will appear on these two signals that is on the bit and bit bar signals the data that is stored will come okay then if bit and bit bar are complementary that is now we are doing the write operation so the first line here is the read operation 
it will be read from the cell and it will appear on the bit and bit bar signals in the second line it is the write operation that is whatever data we want to put into the cell we put into bit and its complement on bit bar and we push it into the cell that is the simple operation of the SRAM signal and this is what is the functionality this is what we want to happen and there are certain conditions why this will not happen automatically because we are looking at two directional flow bi-directional flow in one case we want this to come here and another case we want this to come here and that will not happen unless we have certain conditions that are satisfied and those are together they are called as the cell stability conditions okay so the first we are going to discuss the second one is also similar to that so we will discuss the first condition in more detail what is the meaning of this condition suppose we are trying to do the read operation okay so go back to this diagram here now we said that for the read operation wl equal to 1 that's no problem and both bit and bit bar so we want to read the cell which means that these two we are going to put one okay so this is equal to one and this is also equal to one and whatever is the data let us assume that this is one and this is zero no problem the other thing also can be assumed let us assume for now this is one and this is zero so this is one this is one this signal becomes high okay so we have one here and we have a one here what should happen is this line okay here one and one so nothing happens current equal to zero because vd is equal to zero even though the transistor is on in this side of the circuit okay now one two things can happen one is this one okay sorry this one gets discharged and becomes a zero okay that is one two zero and this is what we want to happen unfortunately the another thing also can happen which means which is that this one okay can stay at one and this gets raised from zero to one because this transistor is on and this one on this side this zero on this side and one thing i forgot to mention is at the top of all this okay this bit and bit bar these are dynamic lines and it will never work out if these are connected permanently to power supply these are charged and then they are disconnected so these bit and bit bar lines are floating okay i forgot to mention that but that is very important for these cells to work these are dynamic lines, meaning we are charging them something like the pre-charge phase itself we are pre-charging them then when wl goes high obviously that has to go low so you can think of one transistor that is here something at the top and the signal is wl bar so as long as wl is zero they are getting charged when wl goes high which means we are reading then these are disconnected so they are floating but they have a value that is given to them so here the bad thing that can happen why is this bad that is very important why is it bad if it goes from 0 to 1 because if this node goes from 0 to 1 okay that means that this is connected to this particular inverter and if this goes from 0 to 1 this will go from 1 to 0 right because it's an inverter inverter input goes to 1 means its output will go to 0 input goes to 1 output goes to 0 which means effectively in the read operation we have changed the state of the memory that is absolutely not allowed because we are only allowed to read the cell and we can read it a thousand times but we should not be changing the data and this should not happen this is a bad thing okay neither this nor its effect this so we have to make sure that the first case that we talked about that is the one that happens not the second case first case is where this continues to be at one 
and this discharges from 1 to 0 so this node stays at 0 this node stays at 1 and there is no change in the state of the cell and we can ignore this part for now because it just stays at 1 let's look at this part okay so we have one transistor here okay and we have another transistor below it and there is a contention on this side is 1 and this side is 0 both are conducting this is also one this is also one okay so this is the output and the output is at 0 and it should continue to be at 0 okay this is going to discharge in this direction and the problem is when this is discharging this might get bumped up that is it might start slowly charging this particular node how do i make sure that that particular phenomenon does not happen and okay so this is a picture for example and this bump okay this is during a read operation we don't want this bump to go too high because then the cells will switch their states and the way we can guarantee that is between a2 and d2 this is a2 okay and this is bottom is d2 so just to make sure that the internal uh, sorry the intermediate node doesn't go too high we have to make sure that this particular transistor is much more powerful okay that is in pulling it to ground compared to this transistor pulling it to power supply it is discharging but during that time it shouldn't switch and uh, that is the condition called as read stability condition that is w by l okay of d2 should be greater than the w by l of a2 access transistor a oh sorry it's going out of the screen a2 okay this is the read stability condition and if you are thinking what about the data what about the other transistor then a similar condition instead of data being stored as one it could have been zero so in that case if we do the same analysis the condition that we will come up with is w by l of d1 should be greater than the w by l of access transistor a1 so the first condition of the restability condition tells us that the pull down transistors d1 and d2 should be stronger than the access transistors a1 and a2 if we can guarantee this then during the read operation we will get this type of functional that is the intermediate node will get slightly bumped up when the bit is discharging but it will not switch the data so this is the first condition called as read stability condition now the next condition okay is with respect to the right part now in the right operation we have another requirement that whatever is there in the let's erase all this whatever is there in the bit lines it should get into the cell okay so i am putting bit equal to one for example and uh, i will not put bit bar also equal to one i will make sure that i make this complement okay now i want this one to go into the cell let's say that this is equal to zero and if this is equal to zero this will be equal to one because it's a inverter so this is there now i have one here i have zero here okay now i want this to come into the cell i don't want it to overwrite the bit lines the bit lines this time should not be overwritten they should get 
change the data inside the cell okay how can we guarantee that and uh, that is the right stability condition okay. so now we the read stability itself creates a problem for us because now this data is zero okay which means that this is one and if this is one okay it's connected to this transistor so this transistor is conducting and if we assume that one is here zero is here so one will get written to here through this access transistor that will not happen because our read stability condition said that we should not allow this one to get overwritten through the pull down transistor so this q will not become one because of the sizing d1 is stronger than e1 the way we can try to get it done the way we actually get it done is through the other inverter so here this is zero which means this nmos transistor is not conducting okay mm -hmm. out of the picture now we have this node here and uh, this is zero which means we are giving that to the pmos transistor so pmos transistor is conducting okay and nmos transistor is also conducting because access transistor is on so now you have two transistors this is transistor p2 and p2 input is zero which means p2 is conducting and the other is transistor a2 a2 is also conducting because this is p2 and this is a2 okay and here this is connected to power supply and this is the output now we want the opposite to happen now this is trying to pull it to power supply this is trying to pull it to ground okay and we want it to go towards ground because that's the way we can try to make this go low okay and once this goes slow that is coming as input to this then it will switch to high so this has to go from 1 to 0 it has to go this time okay and once this starts going to zero through this node okay because it's connected to the input this inverter will switch from zero to one it's not happening through the access transistor it's happening through the other inverter input and for that to happen so output should go from one to zero so same logic we can apply we can depend on the strengths of the relative strengths of the transistor so we have to conclude that w by l of a2 should be greater than the w by l of p2 and this a2 sorry this will guarantee that the output node there is a contention this transistor is trying to pull it up to vdd Okay, this transistor is trying to pull it up to ground we have to make sure that this node gets driven to ground and the way we can get that is through the pull down transistor it might not go all the way to ground because definitely like similar to a pseudo nmos this is permanently connected to vdd but if it starts going towards the ground okay eventually one will start becoming zero and this will switch so then these two inputs can reinforce themselves because they're back-to-back transistors it will become a perfect zero it's not a perfect zero it might be around 0 0.3 or 0 0.2 volts but that is enough for this transistor to switch from zero to one and once this switches to one now we don't have to depend on this line anymore this will come perfectly and it will become a perfect value of zero so that is the way the transistor is written i'm sorry the cell is written into through the bit lines okay they provide initial push in some way then because the inverters themselves switch their state they reinforce themselves the back-to-back -back inverters and we get the perfect value written into the cell so that second condition is called as the right stability condition and thankfully they are not conflicting with the previous one the previous condition said that d2 has to be stronger than a2 
here we are comparing A2 with the pull up transistor P2. We are not comparing again these two. If I am saying that the opposite condition now has to be true, we can never design a cell because one condition requires this, another condition requires its opposite means that's not possible. Here we are comparing A2 and P2 for the right stability condition and the condition says that W by L of A2, this access transistor has to be stronger than the pull up transistor P2 and the same thing here also A1 has to be stronger than P1. So overall we can summarize these two together as the cell stability condition okay that is we have the NMOS pull down transistor that is D1 and D2 these are the strongest so one example may be 8 by 2. The access transistor are weaker okay this is the read stability condition maybe 4 by 2 weaker than the NMOS pull down transistors and finally the pull up transistors P1 and P2 are the weakest they have to be weaker than this so one example is 4 by 3 so together this is called as the cell stability simultaneously the read and write stability have to be satisfied this overall is the design of the SRAM cell there is the operation and then there is a stability condition for read and write together the cell stability condition so we'll stop here